Hello everyone, my name is Brad Haberkoss. I'm an associate professor at the University of Colorado and excited to present to you all today about angioaminoblastic T-cell lymphoma. And I want to thank the LRF for, for putting this together. So quick background or quick outline on what I'll be discussing today. I'll give you some initially some introduction on angioaminoblastic T-cell lymphoma. We'll discuss some of the historical perspective on angioaminoblastic T-cell lymphoma, I'll discuss some of the treatment options available, and then discuss, uh, after we discuss initial treatment options, go into some of the relapsed options and, and potential future directions that I think we're heading with this disease. So a little bit of introduction to T-cell lymphomas and background, which is probably no, um, just pr probably not anything new to this audience, but T-cell lymphomas are, of course, rare. They encompass about 10 to 15% of non-Hodgkin lymphomas, and this really equates to about two cases for every 100,000 individuals per year. And as uh, any of you can also probably appreciate, they are a complicated set of diseases, both to diagnose and to treat. And to to start out, you know, we want to discuss some of the uh, initial workup for aggressive T cell for these aggressive T cell lymphomas. Um, really requires kind of an integration of both the clinical laboratory, histologic, and genome phenotypic information these days. To really come up with the right diagnosis uh, really requires kind of the, the culmination of all of these, these uh, pieces. And secondarily, certainly involvement with a pathologist that understands and knows T-cell lymphoma is important to coming up with the right diagnosis, coming up with a diagnosis for that matter. Because unfortunately, still, there's a number of cases that are misclassified or misdiagnosed even. Uh, and this is, this is mainly misclassification within the diagnosis of T-cell lymphoma. But there are some rare cases where uh, a T-cell lymphoma can be mistaken for a B-cell lymphoma uh, or vice versa. And so it is really essential to make sure that we have an accurate diagnosis and a correct diagnosis before we embark on any kind of discussion about prognosis and, and future treatment options. And also, as I'm sure you can appreciate, there are multiple different subtypes of T-cell lymphoma, one of which, and the one we'll be discussing mainly today, is angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma. So I mentioned that it's essential to come up with the right diagnosis and in order to, to come up with the right diagnosis, it's, it's essential that we do these these steps in the in the part as part of the workup. So uh, there's of course you know uh, exam where we're feeling for lymphadenopathy, uh, enlarged lymph nodes, enlarged spleen, uh, assessing for various symptoms and and things like skin rash or fever, chills, night sweats, all all sort of key pieces to the to the history. <clears throat> but we're also important to get a number of laboratory testing that helps us not only clarify maybe the diagnosis, but also helps us uh, prognosticate, which I'll kind of elaborate on uh, later during the talk. And then uh, we want to get a imaging to assess everywhere that the disease is located. And and really what you see underlined there, which is really critical step in all of this, is, is getting enough tissue or a, enough of a sample from the tumor biopsy to ensure that we can get all of that information that I mentioned on the prior slide. So we want to make sure that we have enough for the pathologist to review, to look at on a microscope, to look at how those cells look, and to see what markers those cells might express. And then also getting some of the, the, the more nuanced molecular information in the form of the genetic information that I was also alluding to. And what you see here underlined is you maybe can imagine or appreciate that because we need to get so much information on the tumor biopsy to come up with the right diagnosis and ultimately the right treatment plan, we 
really getting a tiny specimen is just going to be insufficient. And so what you see there, it says FNA alone is not sufficient for the initial diagnosis. Uh, so an FNA <clears throat> stands for a fine needle aspiration, and that's really an inadequate way to diagnose lymphoma and certainly an inadequate way to diagnose T-cell lymphoma, and any pathologist is going to tell you that. We need multiple, what we call core needle biopsies, to, to be able to get all of this, this correct information. And unfortunately, uh, you know, that often means that, that sometimes we have to get multiple biopsies in T-cell lymphoma and multiple biopsies, certainly another subsequent biopsies if people are to, to relapse. And then you see there's some of the tests that are useful under certain circumstances, like assessing the central nervous system, things like lumbar punctures, spinal taps. Uh, sometimes we see rashes, especially in angiomatoblastic T-cell lymphoma. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the characteristic features clinically about, of AITL or angiomatoblastic T-cell lymphoma. And sometimes mentioned we do see skin biopsies. It's sometimes helpful to get a biopsy of the skin in addition to biopsying the lymph node, which is what most patients, most individuals, um, what, what is biopsied on most individuals in how we get the diagnosis there. And I mentioned some of the molecular analyses that are really critical to get to, to ensure that this is the right diagnosis and then ultimately getting the right plan. So there are multiple systems to categorize T-cell lymphoma, and this is probably, uh, uh, you know, information you all know, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, we have an overarching theme of lymphoma. Lymphomas get break, broken down to whether they're Hodgkin lymphomas or non-Hodgkin lymphomas. A T-cell lymphoma is a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Within non-Hodgkin lymphomas, things get broken down by whether they're B-cells or T-cells or NK-cells. And you see that within uh, the T or NK cell uh, subheading, there are things that are primary cutaneous T cell lymphomas. And then there are diseases that are more systemic. And sometimes individuals will classify those as extranodal or leukemic diseases or nodal diseases. And angiomatoblastic T cell lymphoma mainly fit into these nodal or system nodal uh, systemic T-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas. This is a uh, categorization system that, that some others use to help us. These are all the subtypes of T-cell lymphoma. And what you see highlighted there in the red box is the, is the angioneblastic T-cell lymphomas, the AITLs. But in the newest iteration of the World Health Organization classification system of lymphoid neoplasms, these what we call nodal T-cell lymphomas with a follicular helper phenotype is a larger umbrella term for all three of those entities that you see highlighted there. So again, these are nodal diseases of T-cell that are T-cell lymphoma, no, lymph node diseases I'm talking about are, are nodal diseases. And these angioneblastic T-cell lymphomas, as well as follicular T-cell lymphomas, which is FTCL, as well as nodal PTCLs with a T-follicular phenotype, all fit into this big basket that we now call nodal T-cell lymphomas with a T-follicular helper phenotype. Some, some uh, semantics may be there, but mostly what we'll discuss is about angioneoblastic T-cell lymphoma is really applicable to all to these other two types of uh, follicular helper uh, T-cell lymphomas. And I think that's just important to remember because sometimes on your pathology reports, they don't always clearly spell out angioneoblastic T-cell lymphoma. They may say nodal PTCL with a TFH phenotype. And for the most part, we really consider these these three entities very similar to each other and, um, and kind of get lumped in together in, in, um, in terms of our treatment approaches. The most con there are six main or six major uh, common 
subtypes of peripheral T-cell lymphoma, and they really comprise more than 75% of cases. And so you see here that PTCL NOS, which we're not really going to get into today, but the angioblastic T-cell lymphoma, the ALCLs, those really encompass the vast majority of PTCLs. And those you see here are all listed as nodal T-cell lymphomas. So we'll jump kind of into more about angioblastic T-cell lymphoma <clears throat> and its uh, cousins, the sort of nodal T-cell lymphomas with a T follicular helper phenotype. So you see here the three main subtypes of nodal T-cell lymphomas that I mentioned, PTCL, NOS, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and then the nodal T-cell lymphomas with a T follicular helper phenotype. It's kind of a mouthful, sorry. Uh, in a subset of those nodal T cell lymphomas of the T follicular helper phenotype is AITL. Uh, but they tend to, to look very similar and present very similar. And so the general clinical features or how someone presents with AITL, they often have lymphadenopathy in, uh, throughout their neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, uh, pretty much everywhere. Often individuals can have a rash that, uh, and they often have systemic symptoms, meaning they can have fever, chills, night sweats. Uh, those, those are very, very common in angioblastic T-cell lymphoma, as well as its, its uh, TFH phenotype, other nodal T-cell lymphomas. Um, we often could see you know, things like effusions that you might, the fluid in the lungs, fluid, people can come in very edematous with like lower extremity edema in their legs, uh, edema in the throughout their whole body is not an uncommon presentation that we run into. <clears throat> they can often have other sorts of autoimmune manifestations. So, you know, you think about things like rheumatoid arthritis, people often can present with very uh, painful arthralgias. Uh, sometimes people present with things called hemolytic anemia or ITP, immune thrombocytopenic immune mediated thrombocytopenia. Uh, these are relatively pretty common um, presentations or, or things that coexist with angiomyoblastic T-cell lymphoma. So it's not uncommon that a angiomyoblastic T-cell lymphoma may initially present you know, to primary care or um, a, even a rheumatologist because of a question of a diagnosis about a rheumatologic disorder like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. But with uh, with the proper workup that I mentioned before, lymph node biopsies, we would identify some of these key pathologic features that you see listed here. And these are some of the markers that we'd look for in on the tumor cells of the, uh, the, the T cell tumor cells. This is, you know, probably a deeper, uh, deeper dive into the disease than, than maybe y'all care to uh, no, but just these are the markers that are relevant that we we look for. The angioblastic T cell lymphomas are are often are often uh, uh, we often also see EBV or Epstein Barr virus uh, present in the tumor microenvironment or tumor milieu along with the abnormal T cells, and these are commonly in the immune in the in the B cells. Uh, and sometimes we even see coexisting B cell lymphoma with a T cell lymphoma in these angiomyoblastic T cell lymphoma. So I think it, the you know these are just some important things to to consider or sort of have a sense of what what angiomyoblastic T cell is all about. I'll go through these things kind of a couple times throughout the talk. So it's you know if you don't catch it the first time, hopefully we can. Uh, rehash this and go over it again. Most patients present with stage three, stage four disease. I'm not going to go through the staging system in great detail. Uh, staging system doesn't mean quite as much in the in lymphoma world. It's more of a class, more of a way that we can classify exactly where the lymphoma is located on a PET scan. But almost everybody presents with stage three or stage four disease, meaning that there are uh, lymphadenopathy, you know, from kind of head to toe. Uh, the average age that people present is around 65. And so this just, again, a, a slide demonstrating some of the markers that we see in angioblastic T-cell lymphoma. We uh, know that these angioblastic T-cell lymphomas, uh, as well as the nodal uh, peripheral T-cell lymphomas, the T-follicular helper phenotype, 
have a, have a lot of these what we call T follicular helper markers. Uh, they are universally um, CD4 positive. I mentioned some of the things that we sometimes see, like EBV positivity. Uh, this is a, a slide sort of demonstrating how some can differentiate between systemic aggressive nodal T-cell lymphomas, like angioblastic T-cell lymphoma, from aggressive B-cell lymphomas. Uh, you see here in this comparison that most people present you know, with uh, more advanced stage disease, stage three, stage four. Most people with T-cell lymphoma present with more constitutional symptoms like fever, chills, night sweats. Most people will present with, or not most people, but um, a sizable proportion of people will present with bone marrow involvement. And many people also have skin lesions compared to the B-cell counterparts where it's a, a bit less common to have all of those things. And this is a nice study that was recently published <clears throat> showing the various characteristics specific to angioblastic T-cell lymphoma patients. So this is really just looking at the AITL population. And we see majority of people, as I mentioned before, are over 60. Uh, we see a number of things we can pull out here. Most are stage 3, 4 disease. Uh, many have constitutional symptoms that we call B symptoms. A smaller proportion of individuals have large lymph nodes, but many people um, have lymphadenopathy, small volume lymphadenopathy throughout. Um, a little bit, and then we also look at these markers, these things called LDH and other inflammatory markers, which I'll show on the next slide as well, that are often elevated in angioblastic T cell lymphoma. And this is this is really. Uh, uh, because angioblastic T cell lymphoma has a lot causes a lot of immune dysregulation and inflammation in the body, and so we see these inflammatory markers that are often elevated, like LDH, uh, C reactive protein, and others. So you see here, CRP or C reactive protein is typically elevated in angioblastic T cell lymphoma patients. We uh, also, also see that many people have come in with a little bit of anemia, uh, as well as uh, other other uh, features here, like this beta two microglobulin, which is another marker that we see that's elevated in the setting of inflammation. So these are often elevated in angioblastic T cell lymphoma, and just speaks uh, and highlights the the kind of uh, points that I was making earlier about many patients having. A lot of constitutional symptoms, fever, chills, night sweats, just a lot of inflammation in the body. Sometimes that inflammation causes things like effusions or fluid in the lungs or swelling all over the body. Uh, these are relatively common at uh, presentation with angioblastic T cell lymphoma and often get better with treatment. Important to remember that too. These are a number of scoring systems or prognostic symptoms that we think about using, and which I'll discuss as well. So there are, uh, as I mentioned, a number of different nodal uh, T-cell lymphoma subtypes. The angioblastic T-cell lymphoma tends to, to not do quite as well overall as the anaplastic large cell lymphomas. In, but I w maybe want you to, to think about this slide and keep it in context when I show some a some, uh, few slides uh, and a few, few more slides because it gives you maybe a sense that we're maybe making some progress in, in this disease and maybe improving our outcomes. Um, so there's definitely some hope and, and optimism uh, in this disease that, that we can do better and maybe are doing better. But historically, we certainly need to do better and find better treatment options. This is data from a large uh, international, called International T-Cell Project, looking at outcomes on many uh, patients, uh, and this just kind of sh shows similar outcomes to what I showed in the prior slide, but really just a specific, specifically focusing on in on the angioblastic T cell lymphoma patients, showing that that you know while you know half of patients may remain alive many years out after after treatment from angioblastic T cell lymphoma, most people. Um, are going on, are relapsing and requiring subsequent treatments after their initial treatment. 
but this is you know still uh, upwards of a third seem like maybe they're cured uh, by initial induction chemotherapy, which we'll get into and talk about what that exactly is. So these are the prognostic models that that certainly don't don't expect you all to to remember. Uh, there won't be a test, but just, just to know that these are things that when uh, your oncologist or myself sees sees you, we think about uh, classifying whether you sort of have high risk features or low risk features, uh, and that may may help us uh, sort of prognosticate a bit and give us a better sense of what our chances of of um, getting rid of this lymphoma with initial therapy. And so these are are have a lot of those measures that I mentioned before, uh, things like LDH and age and how, how fit an individual is, your, your performance status, your stage. These are all factors that we think about, think about uh, looking at. And so this, based on, this is a recent scoring system that was developed, uh, demonstrating just these factors here listed on the far right column under AITL score that were sort of most predictive of outcome and we developed this specific angiomatoblastic T-cell prognostic scoring system. And this is something that, that we certainly use and think about uh, when we see individuals with this disease. And so getting back to maybe how this looks from a patient perspective and, and patient view, uh, this is a pretty typical individual that we might see. So a 67-year-old uh, woman, she's got a history of this vasculitis, which is a an autoimmune disease, more or less, <clears throat> that developed a number of months prior to presenting. So I mentioned before that individuals with angioplastic T-cell lymphoma sometimes have these kind of autoimmune-like features when they're initially diagnosed. Uh, of course, by no means do... do uh, all autoimmune, you know, many, there are many people with autoimmune diseases out there that don't have T-cell lymphoma, uh, but, but we do see that in AITL, autoimmune diseases are uh, not uncommon at diagnosis. And then with treatment, they tend to get better. Uh, so this individual, you know, presented typical symptoms, arthralgias, so just some aches in, in uh, the joints, uh, presented with night sweats and, and fevers and fatigue, and on exam had this kind of erythematous skin rash that was widespread, uh, also with widespread lymphadenopathy that the that this person had, and bilateral edema. So it kind of hits on maybe some of all the points that I had mentioned before about how this clinically can present. Uh, this person had was a little bit anemic, a little bit low platelets. These are all features that we see because this disease often causes a lot of inflammation and causes the immune system to kind of go haywire. We sometimes see that these proteins uh, or these antibodies uh, called IgG uh, or IgA or IgM can sometimes be elevated. And we often see that in, in, the, in this disease as well. So uh, to, get the, to get the right diagnosis on this patient, you see in this, in this slide, we got a PET scan, we got a lymph node biopsy, we got a bone marrow biopsy to all help us uh, ensure that we had the right diagnosis of angiomyoblastic T-cell lymphoma. And uh, you see some of the markers that I commented on there before of, of CD4 positivity and some of the other, what we would classify as follicular helper T-cell lymphoma markers. And uh, the PET scan also supports kind of what our clinical exam of lymphadenopathy in, in many places. Um, I also mentioned this individual also had sort of EBV positivity or Epstein-Barr Epstein -Barr virus positivity. And this is uh, relevant or maybe relevant to some of our future treatment options, which I'll kind of elaborate on in, in a little bit here. So initially, our approach to treatment involves uh, really intensive treatment for a potential curative goal. Uh, we, uh, people present with widespread lymphadenopathy, we often will 
we always almost give six cycles of chemotherapy. We use one of these chemotherapy regimens. They're, uh, we use these regimens in angioblastic T-cell lymphoma. Uh, we use, we use one of these regimens, CHOP, CHOP, EPOC, Brintuximab, CHP. There's some subtle differences between each of these regimens, but more or less they're all, they all include doxorubicin and they are all things that we consider doing and they're all given with an intensive, they're all intensive regimens and they're all given with potential for a, a cure, for a curative goal. So the uh, standard treatments I mentioned there, uh, these after initial induction therapy with uh, one of those regimens, we often think about doing something called autologous stem cell transplant to kind of, if there are any cancer cells still remaining that are hiding somewhere in the body, we try to do this intensive, even more intensive autologous transplant to just knock them out and get rid of them. Uh, and this works for some individuals, you know, maybe, uh, maybe upwards of, of 40, you know, not quite half, but probably 40% of individuals. And so there are people that are, that are cured with this approach. And so while it seems, you know, relatively intense and it is intense, I guess, uh, not relatively intense, but is intense, uh, that it can work and provide very long remissions and responses. But unfortunately, still the majority of individuals do do recur or do relapse. And so one of the, the newest regimens that we have in our arsenal is based on this Echelon 2 study, where we used this regimen that I mentioned before, Brentuximab CHP, and we did a big randomized study that compared Brentuximab CHP versus CHOP. CHOP being the standard, uh, patients with this technically did not include all angiomyoblastic T-cell lymphoma, would only include the angioblastic T-cell lymphoma that would have more than 10% uh, CD30 expression, CD30 being a marker on the surface of the cancer cells. And what we see is that in this study, Brentuximab CHP was, was certainly the superior regimen for a different subtype of T-cell lymphoma called angioblastic T-cell lymphoma. And uh, when we tease out kind of just the angioblastic T-cell lymphoma patients, it's not particularly clear that patients did better with Brentuximab CHP versus CHOP, although the study wasn't exactly powered to look at this question. But you can see here uh, on the, the curves to the left where the uh, progression-free survival curves, you see that the curve of patients that got CHOP did fairly similar to the Brentuximab CHP uh, arm as well. So, the, you know, the good news, Brentuximab CHP is a, a, a reasonable, it was a reasonable alternative to CHOP in that it produced relatively similar safe, uh, was, similar, was similar in terms of its safety. Uh, it's not particularly clear that it might, that is better than CHOP, but it is a good it's a it's a sort of regimen that we have in our toolbox and something that we can think about and it's kind of the newest regimen that that we utilize in but we still consider kind of some some of these older regimens like the epoch show up chop that i had mentioned previously so it's it, it remains an option for us as we we think about treating treating individuals with angioblastic t-cell lymphoma but unfortunately it is not it is not didn't work as well as we would have hoped as as uh, it did in the the subtype of anaplastic large cell lymphomas. So of course you want to do better, and I think this is maybe where some of the more exciting part of the talk, uh, where we can talk about some of the the newer stuff that's going on and and how we're learning that angioplastic T cell lymphoma really responds differently to. To different types of therapies and so this is just a list of different trials that are ongoing um, or that have recently been published looking at uh, all aggressive nodal t-cell lymphomas but one of the things that we've seen here is that certainly in this top regimen here this azacitidine regimen with CHOP azacitidine is a, a newer drug that's been studied in a relapsed setting and uh, is is being studied in the 
uh, upfront setting, we see that many patients, patients did very well with the oral ACE cytidine plus CHOP, and most of those patients, 17 of 20, were the follicular helper phenotype, many of which were AITL. And so this maybe gives us a hint that patient, that this azacitidine drug is a good drug for patients with AITL. And it's something now that in the bolded study there, you see that we're looking at further in a big, large, larger study to compare azacitidine plus CHOP or CHOP versus uh, another newer drug called duvelisib plus CHOP in CD30 negative uh, T cell lymphomas, also including angioblastic T cell lymphoma. <clears throat> I mentioned the slides prior to this that that uh, you know even if we even if even if we have better good outcomes or good responses with our initial therapy, we do think that there's a a pretty clear role for autologous bone marrow transplant in is in T cell in all nodal T cell lymphomas, but we also uh, especially think there's probably an important role for it in AITL. So this is also a newer study, more recently published, where you see this red line at the top is patients that got an auto autologous transplant in comparison to patients that were not transplanted, and the curves on the right side. This would represent patients uh, that never relapsed or didn't relapse at least 60 months after their initial therapy. And this line is relatively flat, suggesting that these hopefully these patients are cured. And so this is a, um, you know, a very pretty encouraging uh, percent of individuals that remain in remission, nearly 80% that remain in remission after an autologous transplant. And so this, not everyone is eligible for an autologous stem cell transplant, but if individuals are, it is it most certainly something that we consider in, in part because of this really good data in, in angioblastic T cell lymphoma, maybe even more so than other subtypes. So just to kind of recap some of the things that, that we've talked about, you know, we talked about AITL uh, being kind of a disease mainly in people that are over 60. Uh, they're most people are present with advanced stage disease. Most people have a lot of symptoms. Uh, they often can have kind of other sort of immunologic phenomenon that, that coexist at a new diagnosis of angioblastic T cell lymphoma. And uh, these are the markers that, that we look for and emphasizes the point that it's really critical to make sure that we have enough of a tumor biopsy or enough tissue from to be able to get all this, this information. <laughs> And so this, getting back to our case and how this, this individual was, was treated, uh, they initially had uh, six cycles of uh, anthracycline-based chemotherapy. So, you know, this, this could have been a patient that, that got CHOP or CHOAP or uh, Brentuxmab CHP. Any of these regimens could, would, have been, would have been options and things to discuss. This patient got into a remission and... Um, but, you know, unfortunately developed uh, relapsed, or unfortunately developed recurrent lymphadenopathy and relapsed disease. We uh, like to biopsy it again at relapse just to ensure that this is the right diagnosis and have the right treatment plan. We do this mutational profiling to help us better understand and characterize the disease, which sometimes, uh, especially in cases where this might not be a clear-cut angioblastic T-cell lymphoma. Maybe this is a nodal T-cell lymphoma, a T follicular helper phenotype. It could help us better characterize the disease and may have some treatment implications. So we do generally like to get that, that information. And then we discuss the various treatment options. And, you know, the title of my talk being that, that AITL, you know, one size may not fit all for for, for this disease. And I think we are at a point now where we can really think about AITL um, as, as a different disease in, than other T cell lymphomas. And I think that our treatment, out, our, our responses to treatment are also very different across the different therapies for angioblastic T cell lymphoma. And AITL, as opposed to maybe some of these other these other two that are listed up there, anaplastic large cell lymphoma and the PTCL, not otherwise specified, or NOS, 
it is is has a lot of what we call epigenetic mutations, and uh, thus it seems that maybe epigenetic modification might be a better strategy in angioplastic T cell lymphoma, as opposed to some of these other subtypes. And you can see kind of across the board where these these are all of the drugs that we tend to think about in the relapsed setting for angioplastic T cell lymphoma, and you see very different responses. Or what I see when I look at this, I think these are different responses um, in the in comparing AITL outcomes versus the other two diseases. Uh, and you especially kind of comes out maybe in these last two columns where you see very different higher percents for bolinostat uh, in comparison to PT cell NOS and anaplastic large cell lymphoma. You also see here on the far left side that maybe pralotrexate's not the best drug to use if you have angioplastic T cell lymphoma because it only results in 8% responses. And I apologize if I didn't state earlier, but these were, these percents here that you see are the percent chance of response or the overall response rate that you would see with those drugs and those subtypes. So pralotrexate only having an overall response rate of 8% in AITL uh, versus Valinostat 46% and Dubelisib much higher as well. Uh, and there's been a number of retrospective studies that really suggest that maybe these HDAC inhibitors, HDAC inhibitors being Ramadepsin, Belinostat, seem to probably work better in the AITL subtype. And so these are kind of our, usually our go-to options that we consider for this disease. I mentioned earlier azacitidine. This is a different kind of epigenetic modifying drug that definitely showing some promise, probably especially in the angioblastic T cell from the subtype. And so this is some of our very encouraging, uh, what I think is encouraging data, how we're really, uh, we have all these trials on, for patients in the relapse setting, or really learning that, that AITL is a different disease than the others, and learning to better target it with different treatment options. These are the different mutations that we will look for in uh, T-cell lymphomas. And what you see here is that these diseases uh, not only under the microscope look differently, but when we look at their different mutations that they have, seem like very different diseases. Where AITL has all a um, number of these mutations that are very different than the NO PTCL NOS or, ALC, uh, or, or ALCL. And so it is certainly time that we start to consider that these are just different diseases and we approach them differently. So these are just kind of my take home messages and clinically uh, important messages about, about uh, what I've discussed so far. You know, we often, I now think we're in an era where treatment is, at least in the relapsed setting, treatment is subtype and patient specific. And I think even in the upfront setting, we're getting better at uh, better being able to um, think, you know, think about different treatment options for these certain patients might work better than others. I mentioned this a few times that PTCLs or, or T cell lymphomas of the Fugiapar phenotype can arise really in this very inflammatory state and, and sometimes even go as far as what we would classify as something called HLH or hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. It's just kind of your immune system is, is very, very hyperactive. And this is a scenario sometimes we see for these, these AITLs. And, you know, in the last, uh, you know, section uh, time for my talk, I want to discuss some of the really novel approaches and also very exciting approaches that we're, we're learning about and that are coming down the pike in, 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 in for specifically, specifically for angioplastic T cell lymphoma, but also applied to other T cell lymphomas as well. And you see here a schematic of the different, different potential approaches to T cell lymphomas, uh, different, well, look, I would classify as pathway inhibitors, something called PI3K inhibitors are, are, uh, or PI3 kinase inhibitors are very, are, are now available to us and something that we even consider to use in the relapse setting. The drug that I saw, showed up there before, Duvelisib, uh, shows a very high response rate, specifically in angioplastic T cell lymphoma and is, and is something to consider if, and individuals to relapse. Mention these HDAC or epigenetic 
uh, therapies, hypomethylators, which is what azacitidine is. HDAC inhibitors are ramadepsin and bolinistat. Those are both drugs that we can think about using. And we're still trying to learn uh, lots how, my, how we might be able to use immunotherapeutic strategies, including things like cellular therapy, CAR T-cell therapy, and allogeneic bone marrow transplant. And so I want to give you a quick example of, uh, of an approach that, that we use. And uh, I won't go into the, the details here, but the approach was really focused on if we can utilize or leverage the virus, Epstein-Barr virus, which is present in a number of different types of T-cell lymphomas and is present in some AITLs as well. If we can leverage that being there by targeting it with antiviral medications. Now you can't just target it with antiviral medications for a number of different reasons, but maybe in combination with a drug, um, a HDAC inhibitor, histone deacetylase inhibitor, like the bolinistat and ramadepsin, maybe we can it will make the, the virus sort of sensitive to killing from uh, antivirals. And in doing so, we can kind of induce the cancer cells uh, to die. <clears throat> so this is a, 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 an interesting strategy, and it's really a, a, just a, a lesson maybe that I wanted to highlight of how we're trying to personalize our therapy and trying to individualize our therapy. And in this case, we're focusing on people that have Epstein-Barr virus positivity. Uh, so not everyone that has T-cell lymphoma has e Epstein-Barr virus positivity or Epstein-Barr virus association, but there are certain individuals that do. And in this study, you see highlighted in the yellow, uh, some of the T-cell lymphomas are, that, that we treated in the trial, it's relatively you know small numbers, but high per percent responses with this combination where we're kind of trying to leverage uh, the virus being there taken to our advantage so that we can find better treatment options. <clears throat> and this just showing you if you look at the T the T cell cohort that there are patients that are have responded to this for many, many months, and thus it's just a promising therapy uh, for individuals maybe with this this EBV association. But of course there are other encouraging strategies as well and other other different uh, uh, other different drugs. I've mentioned Dubelisib, which is a PI3K inhibitor, a pathway inhibitor. So this is a pathway that the cancer cells really take advantage of and try to utilize to stay alive and, and, and keep growing. And so this drug called Dubelisib is a pill that individuals can take, has really shown really hot, really good responses in a number of T-cell lymphomas or shown responses in a number of T-cell lymphomas and even higher in the angioplastic T-cell lymphoma subtype that I met, like I showed earlier. Now we're really trying to combine these therapies though with, so we can have even more effective strategies to hopefully put it in, put the cancer in remission, stay in remission for even longer periods of time. So we're combining things like Duvelisib in combination with HDAC or epigenetic modifying therapy like ramadepsin, um, where we studied a different PI3K inhibitor called tenalisib and in combination with ramadepsin and really saw some very nice res overall responses that were higher than you'd expect to see with either drug alone. And uh, but clearly trying, you know, trying to get better and better. There are uh, even newer drugs that kind of combine both the PI3 kinase inhibitor and the the histone deacetylase inhibitor into one single drug, as opposed to these prior studies where there are two drugs. Uh, but this is, you know, really uh, where we're where we're going towards and where the field's moving to, and and I think uh, promising. There are lots of other pathways and uh, that are under investigation. Things called uh, this drug called sertralatinib and uh, that targets a sick jack pathway. Uh, their JAK-STAT pathway is a very relevant pathway and, and a drug called ruxolitinib or JAKAFI that, that we, uh, that was shown, shown to have really nice, uh, outcomes and very, or responses and, uh, uh, patients, especially with maybe that have this JAK or STAT activating mutations where the cancer cells are really reliant on those pathways to stay alive. And so we can, if we can inhibit them with this drug, uh, in theory, people do will do better. 
So we want to take kind of all of these things that we've learned and really combine them with various different different drugs to do better and have better outcomes. And maybe someday we move to a place where we can introduce these combination therapies in the upfront setting to provide more, you know, curative therapy. Uh, I highlight two uh, two regimens here. The first being that one that flashed up there, the the brintuximab plus, plus bendamustine that we utilize sometimes now in the clinic for patients that have CD30 positivity disease. And this other regimen, ramadepsin plus azacitidine, that one seems particularly to be more effective in the AITL subtype. Uh, the dubelisib plus ramadepsin, also a regimen that is is uh, maybe more effective in the AITL subtype, uh, but are all things that, that we're utilizing even now in the clinic in, in the relapsed setting. And so I think it's, you know, before we've gone to a place where maybe uh, we tried one drug, now we're trying two drugs to try to really do better. And those are just were some other combination strategies that, that are all being investigated. And I think good reason to be hopeful and optimistic uh, lots of people want to ask about CAR-based strategies and antibody-based strategies. There are lots of them in investigation, different ways that we can we can uh, try to treat these T-cell lymphomas, different types of CARs. Uh, you often hear about CARs in the setting of B-cell lymphomas, and it's not that uh, not people aren't trying to utilize them in T-cell lymphomas, but we're just... It's a bit more of a tricky situation trying to understand how we can utilize them and how we can make them effective. But, you know, one should certainly be hopeful that we're coming up with better therapies and better options to treat these. Uh, these are a couple other epigenetic strategies that we're utilizing in T-cell lymphomas uh, that, we, that we are encouraged about in the relapse setting. And, and again, maybe someday we can find some combinations to do better in the upfront setting like we did for the anaplastic large cell lymphomas with the brintuximab CHP regimen. There are lots of different immunotherapeutic strategies, my particular interest being in immunotherapy and of course happy to uh, answer any questions that, that may come up about, about any of this, uh, but it is a strategy that I'm super interested in. You know, are there ways that we can help train the immune system to go fight this cancer? Uh, these are just listing a couple of the ways that we're currently trying to, 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 to utilize now in the form of clinical, but all right now in clinical trials, of course. So it's not something that we would do outside the context of a clinical trial. But again, are very encouraging strategies that, that we can... Um, look forward to hopefully having available to us in the future. Things like checkpoint inhibitors, uh, different ways that we can maybe harness a different part of the immune system called NK cells to make them fight the cancer. Or perhaps this last mechanism here that maybe find a way for the macrophages, yet another part of the immune system to fight these cancer cells. And so I think this is all just, you know, super uh, kind of on the cusp of, of really really finding some really new good therapies and combining some of maybe our older drugs that we've learned how to, that we learned are effective, combining them together. Uh, we're sort of on the cusp of, I think, really doing a lot better in this disease. But, uh, you know, currently still, you know, we still have plenty of work to do, right? Plenty of work to do. <laughs> but this is, this is a kind of a summary slide of things that, that I show here, a number of the different treatment options that exist. And when, when I see a patient with T-cell lymphoma in the relapse setting, again, for, for many, for most of the scenarios up at a newly diagnosed individual, we're aiming for a curative intent with kind of the intensive chemotherapy. But in the relapsed setting, we're often thinking about more, more strategic about some of these other therapies. Um, in trying to, to figure out, you know, how we can maybe, how we can just target the cancer cells or selectively target the cancer cells, designing a treatment approach that is individualized for that person, uh, as well as individualized based on the tumor biopsy. And so this is just kind of my view of, of the of the future and, and sort of how I see things uh, moving forward and how maybe I think about managing some of these, these T-cell lymphomas, at least in the relapsed setting.